Dear colleagues around the globe, this is a video clip of a webinar lecture I was able to present uh, on May 20 for the online congress on regenerative dentistry organized by Geistlich. A big pleasure for me to be part of this excellent, excellent one day course. Oh, the last presenter is, is Professor Boozer, and he is going to talk about the excellence of um, uh, the grafting techniques that they are using in Bern. Please, Danny, uh, go ahead with your presentation. Hello, good evening, Istvan. I hope you can hear me. It's a really big pleasure to be back. I have been listening uh, almost the entire Congress, and uh, I'm, I'm very pleased to see the quality and also the excellent discussions we have that we had. Now I want to share my screen and I hope that this time uh, the topic of my lecture is the long-term stability of contour augmentation using GBR and why does it work so well. Now contour augmentation is one of the augmentation techniques used in daily practice in implant dentistry. Before we start, I want to give you greetings from my hometown, Bern in Switzerland, which is a rather small city compared to many, many others on the globe. You see, we are not too far away uh, from the Swiss Alps. Uh, we have an excellent, nice old city and the School of Dental Medicine, where I've been working since 1980 is today one of the top 10 dental schools in the world and this for three years in a row. We are very proud for this achievement and it's mainly due to our research output, strong research in the field of uh, implant dentistry and uh, periodontology and others. We're going to talk about 30 years of development and progress of GBR. And I will show you uh, this slide um, uh, several times with, uh, with uh, important steps done to improve the technique over the 30 years. When we talk about 30 years, then I also want to mention the upcoming uh, the third edition of the GBR book, talking about 30 years of uh, guided bone regeneration. And you see the stellar list of contributors that includes uh, the Bernese team, but then also then, of course, other friends and co and collaborators uh, such as Stephen Chen, you see Sasha Jovanovic, Isabella Rocchietta, Frank Schwartz, and last but not least, our moderator, Istvan Urban. The release date is now set for January 2021. It was originally planned for uh, October 2020 at the EAO Congress but now this Congress has been cancelled. As a typical Congress, it will be probably a virtual Congress and therefore doesn't make sense to release a book when we have a virtual Congress. When you talk about the progress in the field of implant dentistry, we are in a phase of routine. We treat many, many patients in our department, more than 550 a year. Uh, more than 90% today are partially edentulous with the number one indication for implant therapy, the single tooth replacement. Many patients belong to the baby boomer generation, so the mean age of our patient pool today is 63 years. We can offer excellent long-term results to our patients and that's very important to give them a lot of confidence for this decision to go for implant therapy. We also made a significant progress in, uh, since the millennium change with aesthetic outcomes of implant therapy. So when I look back all the years, I think the most important key factor for this progress has been successful bone augmentation in daily practice, and that includes GBR, but also, of course, sinus grafting or sinus floor elevation procedures. So when we look at long-term cases, here you see four aesthetic cases. Uh, on the left side, a 10-year follow-up case. On the right side, a 25-year-old follow-up case. All of them treated with Professor Belzer. You can see that uh, you see the circumferential anchorage of these implants with bone, mainly on the facial aspect, 
to re-establish an intact facial bone wall is probably one of the most important ones. It also improves the aesthetic outcome. The next case is another 25-year-old uh, documentation with successful reach augmentation using block grafts and Gore-Tex membranes done in 1994. The follow-up of this in the meantime, a 85-year-old patient shows excellent intact buccal bone walls for both implants where we had in the beginning only a 3.5 millimeter of crest width. We also see excellent results with sinus floor elevation here, a 20 year follow up documentation, a very important internal vertical bone augmentation in the posterior maxilla. When you look at the long term data from our patients at the University of Bern, you see we have an abundance of publications in the top journals. It started all in 1990 with a one year prospective uh, study and that of course was followed up on different patient pools uh, with multiple papers uh, in recent years on uh, 10 years of follow up. This uh, slide shows three of these uh, 10 year studies. The two latter ones are by Vivian Chapri, one on the GBR staged approach and the other one on GBR simultaneous approach. And you see uh, we have here survival and success rates between 95 and 98 percent. That gives us a lot of confidence that these procedures really do work. Now, what are the important four crucial points from a surgical point of view? You have to select an, an appropriate implant. Then we talk about the implant length, diameter, and strength. The surface is important. Then we put them in a correct position. This has been addressed today several times. Then, as I said, implants must be completely embedded in bone. In particular, should have a facial buccal bone wall, which is intact and not at day of surgery, that should be intact at, at completion of bone healing. So two, three, six months later, depending on the bone grafting procedure you do. And last but not least, the implant should be located in keratinized mucosa. Very important for the long-term stability as well. Today, we're going to talk how to rebuild a facial bone wall because we know from the Arujo papers in post extraction cases, you lose a lot of bone by bundle bone resorption. When we look into different types of implant surgeries, we have implant placement into post extraction sites and we have implant placement into healed sites. Healed sites have been the standard of care in the 1980s. In the days of Bronnemark and Schroeder, you see, and there, of course, you can have a wide reach and you get a thick buckle wall. You can have a thin buckle wall. Of course, there is a lack of bone, then there would be no buckle wall. In post extraction sites, this was discussed today as well. You can have a thick wall phenotype, more than a millimeter, thin wall phenotype, or no facial wall, just a discussion of the two previous papers uh, we have been listening this, ev this evening. When we look into the different types of augmentation, we have vertical bone augmentation, what the uh, East one showed so beautifully. That's a one wall defect. That's the most difficult uh, anato anatomic situation for augmentation. And when we talk about horizontal bone augmentation, then there we should differentiate between three wall defects, two wall defects, and one wall defect. The one wall defect is again a healed site, whereas a three wall and a two wall defect is a post extraction situation. Now my lecture will just concentrate on two wall defects. Often uh, the case when we have an early placement protocol, we do then contour augmentation. And uh, this is in about 70% of the patients we treat and we do when we have to use a GBR procedures. Okay, I want to uh, quickly address this two wall defect concept. You see, the implant is placed in a correct position. The exposed implant surface is inside the alveolar housing, a bony housing, as Sasha says, and you have one wall defect here and the other uh, wall defect are the two walls providing the elements for bone regeneration. 
we can differentiate the defect types. You, you can have a defect which is narrow and deep. Uh, Joseph Kahn calls that a V-shape and deep. Then you can have a wide defect or a U, a U type and medium deep. And you can have very wide W shape and shallow. And then when this gets more and more, then all of a sudden you have a one wall defect. So the exposed implant surface is outside the alveolar or bony housing. So from here to here, the predictability of bone augmentation is, is reduced because the biological situation is more difficult for mother nature. Contour augmentation was established in the late 1990s. It was actually an intense discussion we had with Professor Robert Schenk, at that time an emeritus professor. He deserves a lot of the credit what we have learned in the field of GBR healing in GBR defects. Uh, the, main, uh, the main issue is that we are using a two-layer composite graft. It's a composite graft like what Istvan is doing for vertical augmentation. When we have a two-wall defect, then we do a layering. So we have two layers, autologous bone chips to accelerate bone formation, and the hydroxyapatite-based filler, DBBM, as a bovine filler, uh, for volume improvement and volume maintenance because it has a low substitution rate. In these counter augmentation cases, we can always use a collagen membrane because it's horizontal augmentation and this is only a temporary barrier for about four or six weeks. We don't need a longer barrier function and we don't need an open flap procedure. We always use a primary wound closure. Now, this was developed uh, based on preclinical studies, animal studies uh, with histomorphometry, you see that was done here, the first paper in 1998. Here you see 25 years of research by the Bernese group, and you see the type of defects we have been creating in the posterior area of the mandibular angle of miniature peaks, and then we filled them up with different fillers and put a Gore-Tex membrane on top to exclude the participation of the, uh, the soft tissues. And I show you here then, of course, the histomorphometry, which was done by Bob Schenk at that time, later on then by Dieter Bossart. And here you see two papers by Simon Jensen, an ITI scholar, who was in Bern for a couple of years and as a researcher from Copenhagen. And you see the osteogenic potential has always been clearly the best for autologous bone chips because they release growth factors, they stimulate the growth of bone. Whereas when we talk about volume stability, the substitution rate, then the clear winner is always DBBM. We have now seven published papers with extremely consistent data. And here you see the osteogenic potential of autogenous bone. This is a four week specimen from the 98 paper. You see Bob Schenk got extremely excited about that to see that such a large defect is bridged over in four weeks. When we went into five millimeter defects, we could even see that in two week specimens, a complete bridging over. So that is the osteogenic potential of autologous bone. Then what did we learn later on? In the year 2005, a major paper has been published by Araujo, Rich Alterations and Bundle Bone Resorption. That was actually the basis then for the discussion on the timing of implant placement post-extraction. Very important uh, issue from a clinical point of view. ITI picked it up and then at uh, four consensus conferences addressed this issue several times, the first one in 2003, a paper by Hammerle, then 2008, papers by Stephen Chen, and then later on by Dean Morton, and then also by Herman Gallucci. So you have four different treatment options, and all of them I use today, but not to the same percentage. I'm not so aggressive like our friends from Brazil. I have a lot of concern about this approach because we learned this morning by Dr. Yildiz, you see that he is fixing a lot of failed implants, aesthetic disasters, and the majority of these implants are immediate implants. So out in the field, there are not too many people who can do that properly, and that causes a lot of damage to patients. So I think it's very important, this selection criteria, when to use immediate implants, when to use early placement, when to use late placement. All 
modalities can be used, but you need to have defined selection criteria. My topic is on early placement with contour augmentation, so we wait four, six, or eight weeks, depending on the size of the tooth which is extracted. And you see here how we do that. When there is a thing or no buckle wall, then we are not using any immediate implant placement. Then we go for early placement. We need enough bone, as you can see here, to go for a two wall defect. But we know from a study by Vivian Chapri that we always have that in a post extraction case after eight weeks of healing. So here you see the first case we did in 98. Uh, you see here, patient was six weeks post extraction, first premolar, and you see the procedure we have done, autogenous bone, uh, bios, and a collagen membrane, primary closure. And here you see the patient 20 years later. Uh, you see here, full intact buccal wall, thick buccal wall, and I'm very pleased with this outcome. Then later on in the early 2000s, many tissue level implants placed with early placement protocol. Here you see, and probably narrow defect, medium depth. You see autogenous bone, DBBM, collagen membrane, primary closure. Here you see the patient then 12 years down the road, and you see the implant is very well integrated. It's a tissue level implant, and you see here a fully intact buccal bone wall. Then we made a switch to platform switching implants. These are so-called bone level implants by Strauman. You see uh, here a typical case extraction 2006 and then uh, healed after eight weeks. Bundle bone is gone. We have a spontaneous soft tissue thickening. So we don't do any uh, socket grafting in a case like this, just a collagen plug. Then you see the defect we have and we rebuild that bone with this technique. And you see uh, then uh, the primary closure reopening at that time was three months. And here you see the patient 10 years late as part of a prospective uh, case series study on 20 patients. Extremely stable situation. You see the convexity, the implant shows no sign of re bone loss and you see a fully intact buccal wall and the peak of the facial wall is about a millimeter coronal to the implant shoulder. Okay, we can do the same in two missing centrals, much more tricky, complex procedure. And here you see now uh, we did eight weeks of healing, implant placement, we augmented, we also augmented in, the, in between the two implants, we go for uh, uh, stabilization of the BIOS particles with a fibrin seal, and I will show you later. Primary closure following membrane application, then at reopening three months at that time. And you see here then at the final restoration done by Professor Belzer. And here you see the same patient 11 years later. And you can see that we have a full intact buccal wall, not extremely thick. Today we get better results, as I will show you later, but it's full intact. Uh, you see the peak here on top of the shoulder. Also, and also look this bone volume in between the two implants, no bone loss, so really nice. We of course did also that in uh, mandible. In the mandible it's much more tricky because there the bone fillers have a tendency to glide apically. You see here an healed site, so actually a major atrophy, horizontal atrophy. So the implant bed was prepared. Then we had a very nice edge reach here. You see, so I took that down. I always do that in, in my patients for almost 20 years now. You see, to get a horizontal component in the defect, we open up the marrow cavity, take a torsionous bone, fill in then the autogenous bone to this defect and the horizontal component will stabilize my autogenous bone chips to, uh, to stabilize more than even we use this fibrin sealant. It's called TIS seal from Baxter. And then of course we have a second layer of the DBBM, again TIS seal to stabilize the membrane and then primary closure. So this is a patient I have seen just last week this is now 15 years later. You see very stable soft tissues, uh, implant perfectly integrated 15 years later. And look, the facial bone wall fully intact. And when I show you again what we had, it was about a six millimeter defect uh, uh, on the buccal aspect. 
We are very pleased with that, with the patients we treated in the, in between 2000 and 2010, we did two cohort studies, one uh, prospective up to 10 years. This is the last paper here by Vivian Chapri. Here you see the paper by Chapri and colleagues in the Journal of Dental Research, as a top journal, zero dropout. So we showed in all these papers, all 21 patients from a clinic, Point of view, pest stress measurements, and of course the radiographs. I'll show you only the cone beams we have um, provided at 10 years. And 14 patients, that means 70% at the full intact buccal wall and the peak coronally to the implant shoulder. Then 25%, meaning five patients had a full intact buccal wall, but the first bone to implant contact was slightly below the implant shoulder. And we had one failed case where there was no bone formation, so a 5% failure rate in this study as uh, outlined in the paper. So when we look at the, the, the mean values, the mean value was 1.7 millimeter at 10 years, the thickness, and uh, 0.26 millimeter, the distance from the implant shoulder to the peak coronally to that implant shoulder. So very pleasing data. What else did we do? You see, we fine tuning efforts have been done to improve the procedure, to reduce the morbidity. One, we started to have an, uh, a cell biology lab, and we looked into the role of autologous bone chips. You see, this is completely underused in the United States, which is a complete pity, because they still believe when you take a autologous bone, you have to open up the chin, which is complete nonsense, you see. So the studies that we have published in the top journals by our group, you see, is uh, mainly driven in the beginning uh, by, by Reinhard Gruber. He's now back in Vienna, member of the Osteology Board, uh, then later on by Jordi Gabaye from uh, Barcelona, and uh, Rick Myron, who is now back in the States somewhere, and most recently Maria Asparuova, you see it here. You see, what we analyzed is we, we took the bone and put them into blood and serum uh, combination to see how quick we get growth factors. And here you see the most recent paper in the uh, International Journal of Oral Science, High Impact Journal. You see that we get a very quick release of TGF beta into this uh, BCM. This is Ringer solution and blood serum, you see. And we also get BMP2, but it takes some days eh, to really pick up. So when you apply the, the autogen spawn into the defect, they start to release the BMP2 after a couple of days. And you see, that's the interplay we have between the two, these very important growth factors, TGF beta 1 as a proliferation factor to make sure that these precursor cells move into the defect from the bony walls and the BMP2, a differentiation and mineralization factor. So these osteoblasts form, they duplicate, and they start to produce the osteoid and then mineralize the osteoid. So this is done, as you can see it here. You see that when the flap is raised, we immediately take the blood, and then we mix that with Ringer solution as an agent chloride, so it's not coagulating, see? I'm sure this is by far better than any PRP or PRF. I don't know what, because this is coming from the bone, these growth factors. Then we take locally the bone chips with a sharp bone scraper we use from Hufridi, a reusable bone scraper. You just have to resharpen them from time to time. And you see now these chips go into the blood bath. Mm -hmm. They are about 1.5 to 2 millimeters in size. You can all read that in the papers we have published. So that goes into the blood. And then we continue the implant bed preparation, the defect preparation. And after 15 to 20 minutes, we take a syringe and we aspirate this BCM blood uh, uh, growth factor mixture. And now, of course, we use that to activate the DBBM. Huh? So this is an instant biologic activation of this non-active bone filler. Now all fillers are active because they have all these TGF beta one. So when I show you a recent case done in 2016, you see the tooth has been extracted very carefully. You measure the width of the crest, six plus millimeters, so that's no problem. Then a triangular flap implant bay preparation, the 
has been taken. We always use a two millimeter healing cap and then we do an autogenous bone application first. Small volume, so you don't need a large quantity of uh, bone chips. Then you do the contour, over contour uh, uh, augmentation with uh, the DBBM and then a two double layer technique with the collagen membrane all soaked in BCM. Then a tension free flap closure. Patient will have some swelling in the first two days or so, or three, four days, and then it's diminished again. Here you see then how we are using this correct positioning. This concept of comfort zones was published from an ITI consensus paper 2003. So this is a highly cited paper these days, more than 500 citations. And today we are using eight weeks of healing for more than 10 years now, which is the absolute routine for contour augmentation to all defects. So you see that lady at reopening at eight weeks, a punch technique, no roll flaps, nothing like this. In a routine, I never use a connective tissue graft, so there is no need for soft tissue grafting in cases like this. This is very rarely done in these routine cases. We use most of the connective tissue grafts in failed implants, aesthetic disaster cases when there is a lot of recession. You see the patient at three and a half years, you see the implant well integrated and look this facial bone wall. That's the type of facial bone wall we get when we are using the BCM technique. So you just get more bone formation and you see beautiful uh, uh, in a horizontal cut the, the bone. We also have another case here where I want to show you the, the, the surgery again in a couple of uh, video clips. You see, we collect the blood, we collect the bone, the chips go into the blood bath. You see, here you see the blood. And then uh, we uh, continue, we do the implant bed preparation. We prepare the defect when there are sharp edges here, we always take the sharp edges off because they're gonna resolve anyhow, be resolved anyhow. Then we put an implant in. This is mainly used here, the bone level implant uh, as a platform switching implant. And then of course, we'll make sure that we go, go deep enough, about three millimeters below the future mucosal margin. The palatal wall has to be supra, uh, uh, the, above the shoulder or the shoulder should be subcrestally, very important. And then you see here we do the preparation with the BCM. We take the blood uh, and soak it into the DBBM. Uh, you see we apply autogenous bone chips first. Then we apply uh, then the DBBM particles. And then we start to trim uh, a 25 by 25 millimeter collagen membrane and the collagen membrane is applied always in a double layer technique. Here you see then how it is done. In these kind of cases, there is no need for tax. I love to use tax uh, in, in the mandible, as I was showing in the last case, when uh, there is a risk that the blood, as about the bone fillers could glide apically, and then the tax are extremely useful, as you have seen already in this fantastic presentation by Istvan. And then, of course, primary closure, tension free, if needed, vertical or horizontal mattress sutures, 5 O sutures, releasing incision with 6 O sutures. And here you see the final treatment outcome of this patient done by Professor Belser. This is the implant crown. Look the quality of the tissue. Here you see the perfectly integrated bone level implant. We couldn't get a an, uh, an, uh, cone beam uh, in February because we had closed dental school due to the pandemic situation. I'll show you another case with two missing centrals. You see eight weeks of healing, then the surgery, and you see the same uh, steps all the time. You see here again that the fibrin sealant to stabilize the membrane, a large piece of membrane, primary closure, reopening at eight weeks, here you see the final outcome three and a half years later. And look here, excellent bone in between both implants and look the thickness of these facial walls. Uh, excellent BCM augmentation, activation of the BIOS with uh, TGF-beta-1.
Okay, last point is narrow diameter implants that uh, came to the market about 10 years ago. It helped us, uh, this is uh, this rock solid alloy, helped us to use them more often in the posterior so we could actually get better defect morphology. Here you see a case like this. This is a very narrow reach, uh, probably about four millimeters. And here you chunk the cut so we can place two implants here. So we open up, we prepare the implant bed where we take the bone. And you see then this is extremely thin uh, facial wall. So we take the bone off, horizontal component. We use two tacks in this case with the collagen membrane. Implants are placed, as you can see here. And you see the borderline situation. Uh, that's uh, almost at the surface of the bone, but we are using a lot of autogenous bone and then the DBBM, and then we stabilize it. And then, of course, we have an extremely stable membrane because of the two tacks used uh, on the apical area, and then a tension-free closure, reopening at eight weeks. You see here the tacks were left in place, and here you see the one-year follow-up, and you see this is uh, the kind of results you have seen from Istvan. The stability of the membrane with the tacks really helps you to get excellent excellent augmentation outcomes here uh, as i have seen in about 10 patients i did in the last two years let me come to the conclusion okay the conclusion is first the evidence simultaneous contour is one of the augmentation procedures we use it's well documented up to 10 years prospective studies it requires a two-wall defect uh, and contour augmentation is done with a two-layer composite graft and a barrier membrane See, when we talk about the key factors, you see the two wall defect I mentioned, the, layer, the two layer composite graft with a lotologous bone that it, they are locally harvested, so no additional morbidity, but they speed up uh, bone formation and they speed up healing, so it's quicker. Second, the DBBM gives you more volume to augment and it gives you more volume stability over time because it has a low substitution rate. The collagen membrane is easy to apply, has a temporary barrier function, low complication rate, and you don't have a second open flap procedure, in particular in the aesthetic zone and the primary wound closure. The last one is the progress. You see, we have seen better results in the last five, six years since we understood the BCM technique, that is growth factor release, autologous bone chips really are a tremendous value in combination with DBBM. We made significant progress to reduce the morbidity for patients as well. And that helped us, of course, to have these narrow diameter implants, which optimize often the defect morphology. We can do more often simultaneous or even without GBR. And therefore, the block crafting with a staged approach could be reduced now in our department to less than 5%. And in the early 2000s, we were almost at 20% in daily practice. With that one, I would like to acknowledge uh, all the people helping uh, for many, many years in this research. Of course, our beloved Bob Schenk, who gave us such a tremendous input. And his knowledge was fabulous, and he was just a nice guy. Then Dieter Bossart, who is an excellent successor. Then, of course, Professor Urs Belzer as, uh, as a partner in the prosthetic field. And, of course, also Professor Vivian Chapri, the last 10 years, who took over now the chair position. And uh, she's an excellent surgeon, and we are very positive that she will be a really good successor in this position. If you're interested in our uh, master courses, we have always sold out situations. We still hope to have then our GBR course originally in June now then taking place in November. And the aesthetic master course with Professor Belzer has been moved already to March 21. With that one, I would like to thank you so much for your online attention. If you want to have a handout, uh, you can send it. I will also have uh, a video clip of my presentation. I will put it to our a YouTube channel, so you have a chance to listen and look at this again. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Danny. It was a wonderful presentation, amazing um, uh, documentation. Uh, honestly, I, <laughs> when, I, when, when I'm working on a manuscript, I like to pull the, uh, 
the, the GDR paper, the 10 year follow up paper that you published, um, both the, the going to augmentation and the blog, because I think it's so nicely uh, documented and followed up. So when I'm working on something, I'm looking at, okay, the, I should get close to that, but it's going to be very <laughs> different. So. Yeah, and uh, you have a little bit more difficult situation. I had a huge department that helped me, of course, but uh, teamwork is uh, just, that's the number one prerequisite for success in research. You need to have a strong team, otherwise you can't do it. Yeah, so it, it, it's very, very um, convincing. You, you know, you have the, um, the I, I believe, like a 1.69 millimeters of uh, bone thickness after 10 years after this, this contour augmentation, the very good coronal level of bone. And you mentioned that you don't do, um, the, rarely do any connective tissue graft. And you've shown some amazing, beautiful cases with, together with Professor Belzer. I'm, I'm, I'm referring to one, the two center incisor with the papilla. Yeah. I mean, for like, like that would be on a highlight for like an aesthetic lecture. Or the other one with the, with this, with the, with the center incisor was also perfect. Yeah. The, papillary, the papillary level, I was checking, you know, to, to see any mistakes, but I couldn't find any. So, but, but basically, the, the main reason, I believe, that you don't really need for those cases the connective tissue graft, however, we do a lot of connective tissue grafts, mm -hmm. is that you also publish that once you extract, you basically, the tissue is gaining. So, you, it's like a, a nature provides you a little bit of uh, yes. tissue thickening yes. before you do the I mentioned thing. that only briefly, but when you pull a tooth, I mean, you need to know what you're going to do. So I love to use socket grafting when I know I'm going to place an implant in four months. And then I do it often today, flapless, computer assisted, mainly in elderly patients or in patients with medical risk factors. And of course, not a center incisor, I guess. Huh? But pre molars I love to do that because it's really minimizing uh, then uh, the invasiveness for the patient. But then I know high aesthetic demand, and I go back in at four weeks, six weeks, or eight weeks, depending on the tooth. Huh? When it's a center incisor, it's often six or eight weeks. Huh? Then I don't do anything with that socket, so I let the soft tissue grow in, because in a single tooth situation, the volume of the bone next to that extraction socket will not change at all. It was shown by this paper of Vivian Chapri. That means the soft tissue grows in, you see like an excellent ridge, and then you do a palatal incision and you just take the whole soft tissue as part of your flap. So this is like a built-in connective tissue graft, but it's vascularized. So mm -hmm. that gives us the chance that in most of these cases, there's no need for connective tissue graft. Yeah, that's what I meant. But, but for those um, beautiful crowns, you need a very good prosthodontist and a very good lab. Which yeah, in Switzerland is. <laughs> I think I, I, I should probably also add the technician uh, to my acknowledgement slide because this is Pascal Müller from Zurich. Huh? Uh, he just did for me some veneers in my teeth. You see, uh, he's a fabulous guy. And, uh, and Belser, when it really goes for the best, then he sends all the patients to Zurich to Pascal Müller. And of course, he is, uh, I mean, he's not cheap, but he spends much more time on these cases. And the patients are very satisfied with his excellent performance. Mm -hmm. Again, yeah. teamwork. Yeah. yeah. yeah we know Nicola Petrobon in, in Zurich, who is also a very, yeah. very good person. So um, it's also, I, I, I also love the presentation, the, the, the research about the TGF beta 1 and the BMP2, how the TGF beta 1 is basically collecting and then the BMP2 is basically doing the, the differentiation. The BCM technique is the, uh, the basically you're, you're collecting blood, I believe, then you put it to the uh, chips, the yeah. chips release, and then you transfer that to the, to the BIOS to activate the BIOS at the yeah. time of grafting. And use the beauties, and that's the problem. And uh, the two of us have always been using in the last, I don't know how many years, uh, autogenous bone. Huh? But the problem is in countries where, let's say, where marketing is very strong. Uh, the, most of these are not using autogenous bone because no company can sell autogenous bone. So there is no money to make with this, you see. But actually, I had a long time to convince Geischlich, you see, that autogenous bone is not a competitor to buy us. It's actually 
it's a it's a positive factor because it makes bios much better so actually today that this discussion is finished but 20 years ago they were always arguing against you see so i think this is very interesting uh, we are just in the final phase of a new publication that shows beautifully how bios picks up also how this is attached to bios and how this interferes and then in addition we do now the same study again but this time with human bone chips because the previous study was done with, yeah. with bone <laughs> chips from from pig mandibles from the butchery and we want to repeat that and uh, i think we have done about 10 patients yet and maria Spodo tells us exactly the same data well, not a surprise to us so i think there is still a lot of research to be done and we would love to see other groups to pick it up and also go into these details it's a very interesting biological question mm -hmm. Very good. So I just have two more remarks. Yes. That I picked up. One is the T seal. I think that was very good to, to stabilize the the, um, for the the Baxter product that you yeah. mentioned, and also the uh, the one when you applied the, the pins on the lingual or, or yeah. on, on the apical, then you showed the uh, the uh, the CT scan, and 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 you could see that actually the uh, the graft wanted to migrate. Yeah, and it was like the the membrane held it, and the pins were holding it in place, really nicely. I don't know if anybody picked it up, but that that's that is a perfect CT scan to show what the uh, you know this whole thing uh, stabilization can do with a particulated bone graft. Actually, the one of the screws is overgrown by the bone from the top huh? so to take it out would be not so easy i guess so, so i told the patient look we'll we leave it in place uh, because it only disturbs our eyes when you look at the radiographs huh? so if it's not doing anything it's like an implant you see it's a titanium uh, screw so uh, i love this technique when we have very demanding anatomy also posterior mandible of course is a problem we I mean uh, you i don't have to tell you that so there the gravity is your enemy as i say you see the bone feelers try to glide apically and you need to stop to do that in the maxilla when they glide apically actually then they glide coronally because then they go down and it's in our favor so actually in the mandible uh, gravity is a problem it's much worse yeah mm -hmm. yeah all righty thank you so much for, for this presentation for this day and for your your moderation also in the morning i think with the afternoon session, I think I loved it also. Oh, These cool. five hours just passed very, very fast. I really enjoyed the whole Congress because I think really this was a Congress. I really loved the idea to have the uh, the uh, the you that, that you could apply and, and be a speaker. And I think all four speakers were excellent. We loved that. And um, uh, thank you so much for all the speakers for 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 the presentation and the effort. Also, the the uh, the company Geislich to put so much energy into this uh, to to Mirko especially who, who did um, you know in a in a Swiss precision way organized everything perfectly and uh, um, and so I think I also in thank very thank the all the audience who were here some of you maybe were here the whole day I don't know but thank you so much for the large numbers you were here I really wish you the best and i hope you stay safe i think we still have this virus around for a while but i think we we learn how to to live with with around this and uh we're gonna we're gonna go back to our normal life thank you so much. yes this concludes now this uh, video clip as i mentioned before if you have an interest to to see how these surgical techniques are applied in patients with live surgeries, then uh, I can only encourage you to come to Bern and to see these procedures offered and presented by our team. Uh, uh, we, have, we have welcomed in the past 20 years hundreds of colleagues from all over the place we continue to do that. We have a uh, next GBR master course scheduled in November, and we hope that the uh, pandemic will allow that. Uh, and then the next master's course in aesthetic implant dentistry, a combined course with Professor Belser and Professor Sharp, myself, 
will then be organized and offered in March next year. So all the best, stay safe, stay safe, and uh, bye-bye.